Uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, to start off, uh, uh, Tune and Christine already mentioned a few things about myself. And so that I'm a, my background is from philosophy. Uh, so I could be considered a theorist. Uh, and at the same time, I was taught by my, my philosophical heroes that uh, uh, I should consider philosophy not as a search for truth, uh, but as a creative activity uh, in search of ideas, and uh, all sorts of ideas. Uh, bad, good, true, false, beautiful, ugly, new, old. And uh, here the truth still has a Rule to, rule to play, but other criteria become even more important. For example, um, richness, depth, novelty, relevance, appropriateness, potential, and so on. So for me, the main question uh, is not so much what or why, uh, but uh, instead what if and, uh, and also how. And uh, in order to have ideas, I use and construct different frameworks of thinking, which are sort of glasses you can put on uh, to look at the world in different ways. Uh, none, none of the glasses are universal, so you need to know when you, when you need to take down your current ones and, uh, and use or uh, construct new ones. And even though these frameworks I'm talking about are conceptual or mental, so you cannot see or touch them, uh, I still think they are kind of things. Uh, somebody has to make them. And that's why I also consider myself a maker or a practitioner. And that's why I'm also drawn to other practi practitioners and enjoy all kinds of corporations. So, it's only logical that the current presentation is also a joint presentation, this time with a team of three young architects from Estonia called KU Architects. Uh, I've been lucky to work with them on several architectural competitions uh, and exhibition projects. So the plan uh, for a presentation is that I will first talk from a more abstract viewpoint and one of uh, Kuh uh, Johan Rohtla, will then expand on my words with, with a concrete example. Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm re uh, just, as you know very well, the topic of today's symposium is uh, redressing naked spaces that is giving new identity and new use to spaces that have um, uh, lost their old one. So to use a visual metaphor, I guess we are uh, this is the kind of mental space we are, we, are, we are using. And so the process is understood something like this. Uh, and I guess I'm not too perceptive when I see this reaction in the, uh, in, in, in the whole, whole approach. Uh, a reaction against modernist a notion that uh, every creation happens as if from nothing ex nihilo. And uh, that's why the image of Tabula Plena by Graham Brooker is quite alluring and powerful uh, in this con uh, context. And in much the same spirit, uh, uh, Norwegian design theorist uh, and thinker Jan Michel has argued that the design never comes of nothing, out of nothing. There are always precedents, contexts, beliefs, rules, etc., etc., et that are already there. So instead of an empty space, there is this quite a complex uh, landscape that the designer has to navigate and use. And because the landscape is so complex, there is no other way but to move by uh, iterations. There is cycles of exploration and uh, correction. Each uh, Iteration brings always forth some new unintended consequences. Uh, some are good and some are bad. So the next uh, iterations try to keep the good and get rid of the bad. Uh, much like the evolution in nature works. And uh, it is uh, 
because of this cyclical nature of design and its inevitable use of the previous layers, uh, layers and forma for formations that Michel proposes to talk about every kind of design as, as redesign. So, from this viewpoint, uh, every space is inevitably naked. That is, it's a, it's a raw material for the next uh, changes. Nevertheless, uh, I'd like to argue that there is a special kind of spaces where the idea of nakedness or uh, uh, rawness is realized most fully. And uh, to get there, I first ask you to consider for a moment uh, the overall meaning of nakedness in the case of uh, human beings overall. Because at least for me, the state expresses something essential about us. So, if we talk about the essence of being human, you know, there are lots of big words there. Uh, this immediately brings to mind all these philosophers over the centuries who have um, searched for the, for the essence of man. And this essence has always been uh, uh, defined uh, through something which we have more uh, than animals. For example, humans are said to be rational animals, or political animals, and so on and so on. But if we, if we look at this picture, it stands out on the features we have less than other animals. For example, we have no decent fur, no fangs, no claws, and so on and so on. And uh, if, we, if we think about uh, ourselves from the uh, from the point of view of development, something similar appears. Uh, for example, after a baby there is born, uh, she's able to walk and function within half an hour or even quicker. Uh, for a human baby, it takes a year to begin walking and a lot, uh, lot longer to become really independent. And uh, this long development period can be quite frustrating at times. But with this comes an important advantage. Uh, we, are, uh, we are better able to adjust to the environments we are born in. And probably Sartre had something like this in mind uh, when he famously claimed that uh, in the case of humans, uh, existence precedes essence. That is, humans are animals who have the ability to choose their identity before or, or during, I'm sorry, during the lifetime. But for Sartre, one might argue, at one point of our lives, we will still grow up. Uh, in other words, our identity becomes more and more stable. And uh, this idea, um, I think, can be developed even further. Uh, we can say that the essence of being human is to and never actually achieve maturity. For example, one of the striking features of humans is their fondness for playing. Uh, most animals only play while they, are, while they are young, but humans play throughout their lives. Uh, for example, my grandfather, who passed away uh, a month ago, only managed to, find, uh, to fight the pains of cancer for so long and keep reminding himself of the joys of living only by playing chess on his computer. Or to give a more joyful example, who are designers if not people who love to, uh, love to engage in design plays? Of course, sometimes these plays are very serious, but as uh, designer Paula Scher has uh, very well said, design is most serious when designers are deeply, uh, deeply playful. So we might say that the essence of being human is just this ability to remain in development, to be immature, playful, to be less than an animal. Uh, this condition is not without its fair share of problems, but it also gives us uh, the potential to be flexibly, flexibly in tune with the constantly changing world. But actually, 
it's not my intention here to convince you that this idea of humans as playing animals is really true. Instead, I ask you to engage in a game of im imagination and ask, what if? If this was true, what kind of spaces would support achieving this uh, full potential uh, of the human ability to stay in development and to constantly make new meaning uh, out of old meaning? I propose that this would happen exactly in uh, naked spaces or raw spaces. That is, in spaces which would, like humans, be underdeveloped and would remain underdeveloped. And to explain what I mean, I, I propose to start from a simple analogy with what happens in the glass blower's workshop. That is, at one moment, out of the initial liquid state of glass, which is a state of many possibilities, we get to another phase where we can already see the appearance of the first form, which is uh, in between the liquid and the solid state. Here, there is already a promise of a final form, or a promise for a multitude of final forms. It's not completely formed, uh, unformed anymore, because some of the shape is already there, but it's not fully formed either. It is open. So, we might call it underdetermined. Uh, and in the same way, we could uh, think about a number of uh, different processes. For example, about the search for an idea in the design process. Out of a multitude of half ideas or proto ideas, uh, a first idea appears which makes a connection between the different idea seeds. And in this process of the emergence of a form from a so called field of formation, uh, there is one very, there is one very peculiar phase or peculiar stage where the actual shape or idea is just about to emerge. Like, it's, it could be compared to this feeling when we have, when we sometimes are uh, at loss for words, or we have this, we know this word that must exist somehow, but we're not there yet. It's on, our, on the tip of our tongues. Uh, we already feel it strongly, but we are unable to say it out. And for me, uh, this phase, the, the phase of emerging, uh, emerging uh, form, uh, this phase is a source of endless uh, fascination. And uh, why it's interesting for me, it is because uh, there's something here we can already grasp. So it's something objective. Uh, but the, at the same time, it is also highly subjective. The emerging form strongly suggests to us different ways of further development. And uh, this activates our imagination. It creates an almost irresist irresistible urge to uh, play it out in our heads. And this way, in our experience of it, the emerging form is uh, surrounded by a cloud of imaginary variations or imaginary completions. And uh, with it came, uh, comes a sense of potential. So this brings me to my next question. What would happen if we could somehow manage to pause or stall this process of formation in exactly this very moment before the form finally appears, the final form? in this on, on tip of the tongue state. I would say that the resulting object would be very inspiring. Uh, the, strong, the strong pull of the emerging form creates in us the urge to complete it. And when this is somehow impossible, we are overcome by the wish to complete the formation process in some other level, for example, in our own creative work. So, it, somehow the object uh, becomes inspiring. And the same observations also apply to space. A formation of a unique place might also be paused 
just before its full emergence. And it is exactly this kind of emergent space that I would like to call naked space or raw space in the strongest sense of the word. It would endure in this state of emergence or would like an elastic bang, uh, band return to this state after temporarily acquire, acquiring a more uh, clear-cut identity. And at least uh, for me, there's a big question uh, to what extent uh, this pausing or elasticity uh, is possible. Because what we see again and again is we have these old spaces, we uh, repurpose them uh, for some new, new function or let the function be open. Uh, so it has this rough potential and somehow it loses it over, over time. Sometimes quicker, sometimes it takes longer. Uh, but uh, inevitably, if, uh, if people feel the potential, inevitably uh, at, at, at one point uh, the capital moves in and, and so on and so on. And um, yeah, so the, maybe the best we can hope for is to delay uh, the disappearance of this emergent form uh, only for a bit. Of course, this kind of raw space in its extreme form uh, is not for everybody because different people have different needs for structure and different tolerances of, uh, for ambiguity. Uh, nevertheless, I find it essential that a space would contain at least a degree of rawness or degree of nakedness. And this point is expressed beautifully by Henry Plummer uh, when he says that without this crucial rawness, a space becomes an image, a uh, representation. And it's quite difficult to live in an image. Uh, Plummer writes, and I quote, Space that is lavishly open to human volition requires exceptional generosity on the part of its architect. And this kind of benevolence is blatantly missing from buildings reduced to highly efficient, efficient and stereotype type patterns. But it's it is also missing from many of our most visually dazzling and celebrated buildings, since often, and this is, this is his, his crucial point, the more excitingly original a product becomes, the less creativity is left for others. Uh, he, he continues, this, uh, this, pre this presents a dilemma for any talented but conscientious architect as the endowment or giving away of action or uh, gifting action for other people demands not only a wielding altruism but also a degree of humility, even anonymity uh, from the part of architect. And this poses a generous, genuine threat to a profit and fame in a, in a consumer society. End of quote. So, the spaces which are truly naked are at the same time something which Plummer calls actionable spaces. And the more actionable a space is, the more it supports a rich variety of autonomous actions and, and, and also an ever renewable co-creation of space by its users, making so they can make the space their own, which in turn hopefully encourages them to, keep, uh, to care uh, more deeply about it. So uh, that's why I think the, this nakedness dimension of space is, is something essential and deeply, deeply in, uh, important. And now uh, I'd like to give the floor to Johan Rochtler, who will discuss a case where we were given the opportunity to extensively work with uh, raw space. So, Johan. Uh, does everybody hear me? Okay. Um, as we are already behind schedule and everybody's waiting for lunch, I'm trying to make it brief. Um, 
I will try to illustrate the previous uh, with the example of the building uh, for the Estonian Academy of Arts. Uh, this is um, a competition that we won in 2014 and uh, it was uh, determined to be accommodated into an existing block of buildings from uh, 1930s, 40s and 60s, which is uh, an old textile factor factory. Our proposal was to use the potential of the existing buildings to their maximum extent. Due to constructional and lo logistical reasons, we had to demolish some parts of the complex, but we were able to find a way to reuse the majority of it. The building consists of five blocks, each from a different time period and uh, with a previous different function, uh, which was apparent in the architecture of these blocks. The floor height, the spatial structure, the finesse of brickwork, etc. Um, while one of these wings is especially valuable in the heritage sense, uh, dating from the era between world wars, uh, and obviously with the finest building quality, our concept was not to discriminate uh, the legacy from Soviet years and treat each block with the similar process. Uh, that is to scrape out and expose the layers of interior design. Uh, the only difference is perhaps that uh, in the oldest, oldest part, uh, the uh, scraping is done with a scalpel uh, rather than a, a sand plaster or a or a soda blaster. Um, on one hand, we were faced with a very difficult client, which are art students. Mm. They're full of talent and aspirations to make the world a more beautiful place and have a strong expect expectations towards their environment. But on the other hand, the potential that they uh, described before uh, is always nested in the user. The space can only complement and liberate it. Uh, so we had a lot of potential on our, our hands uh, that could be somehow unleashed or even exploited as we wished. And that is what we tried to do. Uh, for us, the basic question uh, was where do we stop as architects and which decisions do we delegate for the students? Um, from the beginning, we were playing with the idea of raw space. Uh, when the term naked has a certain connota connotation of uh, vulnerability uh, or a fragile state, uh, the term raw for us implied a somewhat different characteristic, uh, a roughness, uh, a willingness to grow or to be finished. Uh, the last thing, thing we wanted to, uh, to do was to create a polished and refined building. We want, to, we want the user to be encouraged to change the space, to materialize their expectations into space. And the building not to restrict, but become a frame, framework for that. Uh, whereas the building will obviously have fixed interior walls the future user will also be equipped with uh, shelves and partitioning elements to divide the space as they see fit a long time. Also, the new building must not be afraid of a nail or a screw to make new partitions into the space. Uh, so we had a... Um, when the shell of the building is uh, scraped and old layers are exposed, uh, we will add uh, a new element or supplement, if you will, uh, the main, main element organizing the building. Uh, this will be, um, uh, it, it will be something that we call an active wall, uh, a distinctly new linear spatial element spanning throughout the building and dividing it into circulation and workspace. Uh, this element will contain a necessary, all necessary supporting communications and infrastructure 
uh, to uh, maintain the surrounding grow space free from partitions and flexible for ad hoc changes. For the user, it will create the same sense of security, orientation, and uh, in the scraped raw shell, and also perhaps encourage intervention. Uh, so this is this is the, how the space looks uh, like now, and um, this is an element that we will. Uh, this is the main element that we will add into the space, which will uh, possibly be the architectural be idea behind the project. And um, by now, the dem demolishing of the building has been almost completed, and the cornerstone was laid uh, this Monday. Uh, so, unfortunately, I can't show pictures of a finished building, but um, instead we will uh, show a video uh, broadcast by our uh, interior architect, uh, who is right now in situ in the place, and um, he will show the raw state that the building is in. Mm, that is all from me. Um, thank you. <laughs>